Bink, the humble monster. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can my shit cracking. Hold on a second. Okay. There we go. Gangster Boogie. Gangster, gangster. Got that background right hard. Oh, yeah, man. You fucking with the background? I'm all in. <laughs> Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit, well, you know, we, we ain't going to mess around. We, we already late. Shit. Oh, okay. My bad, man. Yeah, but no, but, no, I'm, no, 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 I'm late. I'm, I set the tone for being late today. Oh, okay. I had, okay. To, I had to go see these people right quick. Boy, come on, man. It's right up the street. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite? I get that pesto chicken. Oh, and, uh, uh, as far as the smoothie. Peanut, uh, peanut paradise. Okay, I might have to try that one. I usually do the island green with peanut butter. Oh, damn. Yeah. That's new. That's, that's the new Island green with peanut butter and... uh. I never ate that. I never. I haven't had any of their food yet, though. No, they, they're pesto. Try that pesto uh, chicken. I'm gonna have to try this shit to see what they do. I'll be yeah. seeing it. it Smell good. <laughs> <laughs> that pesto chicken be jammed on the one. Word right up, man. You looking like money over there? How you doing, sir? Oh man, we over here rapping, man. We rapping. We rapping. Humble monster hats. Oh, I got these Toomp T-shirts on the way too, bro. Yeah, we rapping. Yeah, you are gonna love it. It's incredible. You know, it's all. Um, you know, the acronym is think out our main, thinking out our main purpose. I like that. Thank you, man. Yeah. I like and, that. And the logo is crazy. It's like, it's like me on a coin, and it's got 1969, and it's got the words over the head, thinking out our main purpose instead of the preferred unum shit. It's it looks crazy. Like an old pres- look like an old president? Like an old president. There you go. <laughs> 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 you know, it's, it's dope, man. I can't wait till it's done. Got the logo together already. My cousin put it together, man. It's stupid. That's the only thing I'm missing still is my logo. Okay. Yeah, I think that's going to be my new logo. And, you know, of course, you know, when the, when the temperature change, get the hoodies and all that shit done, you know? Yeah, you know. Well, you know what? The crazy shit is Cali niggas can do hoodies right now. Yeah, I heard. You know what? Because I, I say I want to do the lightweight hoodies and the uh, heavy ones. You know, the little t-shirt type hoodies? Yeah. Yeah, I love those, actually. You know? Them goddamn Cali niggas, nigga. You know, 6 o'clock, that shit dropped to 60 on your ass. Cali. Yeah, you're right. Cali niggas do be wearing hoodies <laughs> with the shorts. With shorts on. With the and shorts and flip-flops. And flip-flops. <laughs> Just wear the shit up. Yes, sir. But, you know, like I said, without no further ado, no, I haven't really had a stranger on my show yet. It's been all my people. So, you know, uh, <laughs> the legendary... Uh, Hell in starting with Luke Skywalker, man. Making his way on over to ATL. Oh, yeah. Doing big things with T.I., you know what I'm saying? Legendary Grammy Award winning, multi platinum producer, songwriter. Hey, look, I didn't know you were that good of a DJ until you made me go to YouTube. I had to get, check oh, myself. Word. This nigga scratch for real. Yeah, I used to battle, man. I used to straight battle. <laughs> but yeah, everybody, it's is DJ Tump, and I was being guesses already. My guy, what's the word, though? Man, I'm great, bro. You know, feeling like, like, like money, man. My birthday was yesterday. Just turned 51. Hey, man. <laughs> hey, man. That's a blessing. You know, it was a big deal. We came up to be 18. Yeah, man. How about that? So to be 51 is a is a is monumental. Hey, man. I really feel that way. Especially once you cross that whole 50. Lime, once you hit that number, you know, that's half a hundred, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and some people try to look at it like that, but I look at it like, shit, bro, it's that second wave, you know? And it's, it's definitely the uh, uh, third quarter. Yeah. Third quarter of the game. Third quarter of the game. And that's why, boy, every move counts, man. Every investment counts. You know, you know how it, it goes from, okay, if I invest in this, and somebody do me wrong, okay, I'm gonna press charges. But as you get older, you be like, no, bro, I'm gonna hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, I'm not, we ain't pressing no charges. Like, bro, this shit means even more now. And I gotta see, 
You know what I mean? <laughs> so take it that much more personal. Yeah, it's way more personal nowadays, man. So that's why now, you know, every move I make, man, it's really got to be strategic, dog. Hella, hella strategic. But shit, well, being a fifty-one year old, who was your um, who was your first influence? Who made you want to even rock with the music? Like, what, what, what put that, that battery in your back? Wow, what put the battery? Well, I'm gonna tell you the first thing that made me even want to just get into hip hop itself um, was uh, shit, man, seeing Grandmaster Flash, you know, um, right. You know, 60 Minutes, they were talking about the movie Wild Style. And when I saw it, because, you know, I, I was to be fascinated watching the DJ at the skate rink, but I still really didn't understand until I saw, right. it, until I saw it paying attention to how the music was playing. Like, hmm, my version at home don't do that. How he get that part to go so long, you know? And it was like night, a dude named Kenny Boo. It was in 1981. And so when I saw Grandmaster Flash on 60 Minutes, and they were talking about wild style on those turntables, man. That's what made me just wanna just oh man. I, I I wanted to be in a band, I wanted to play baseball and football, but I wanted to be a DJ, man. Once I saw those, you know, some flashing action on those tables, man. I had to get in. So I could feel like magic back then, man. Yeah, it went from him to a grand mix to grand mix of DST. Um these and, Miami guys, you name it? Who DXT? Yeah. Now DST from New York. He was the one who was scratching on Rocket, Herbie Hancock. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Oh, wow. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Dude was cold. He was doing some scratch patterns that we still couldn't figure out, you know, back then. But of course, you know, we could do all that now. But man, he was Absolutely. like ahead of his time, bro. Some goddamn right. mannequin legs in the video. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, do you know? I had to watch MTV all day long just to see that one goddamn video, bro. Hey, bro, and they ran it too. I'm gonna tell you though, did you ever see that HBO special where Herbie Hancock performed it live? You know, he nah. did it on the Grammys too. Nah. Yeah, Rocket was a big record. See, a lot of people just, they, they it, really, Rocket's one of the biggest instrumental records when you think about in, um, in, 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 our, in our genre of music and soul music. He yeah. definitely had a few movies. Yeah, that's all. No, was definitely huge. in the movies. But he performed it on the Grammys, and Grand Mixer was right there with him on the turntables. That's when that shit was like. That's when I knew I wanted to do it. When I saw him on the on the on the Grammys scratching, I was like, "Oh yeah, mom, you got to get. We got. I got to save up and get those two turntables on the mixer." Yeah, the first, first time I seen him, that damn light on the side of that turntable, <laughs> seeing them dots. Oh yeah, spin around. And it's see, like magic, man. And when I first saw it, that was the Technique 1200. That was on that Malcolm McLaren album cover. Do you like scratching? And we heard that they want they want a 1200 yet though because you're talking about the ones my uncle and them used to have. You know what oh, I mean? Okay. Oh, you're talking, oh, you talking about yeah, with just the dots, just the strobe yes. light itself with the big yes. thick ladder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. That's yeah, the that's first one I seen. You know what I mean? I ain't get my eyes on the 1200 since I seen. Uh, DMC with, with, with it in the red cases and shit. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. The tour and shit. That was when I first got my eyes on them joints. But okay, okay. You know, you know, everybody had back then had a component set. Remember that component set. Boy, don't yeah. you touch your dad high five. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle figured out how to record the quiet storm on the radio on the eight track. On the eight track. You know what? They did have some eight tracks that had a record button on them. I record. I couldn't keep. I couldn't keep it. Get it to stay in though, because you had to put. You had to put the. You had to put the paper in the back of the A track. I ain't know that. <laughs> hey man, those were the days, bro. But think about it, man. How we we saw music go from wax to A track. Well, first, well, I mean, we we wasn't around for when it was just on the radio. But you know, I guess yeah. The first way that music was able, able to be, get purchased was wax, of course. Yeah, the seventy eight. Yes, yeah, with, the, with the, the, the orchestra records. Yeah. Hmm. Just think that was the beginning of music being purchased. Think about how futuristic that was back then when somebody came up with that. But he was like the Zuckerberg back then. And the, the turntable on TV had that that big ass circle on it to drop down that little. 
That big ass, yeah, remember? Yeah, that, that, that needle, bro, that needle, that needle looked like some sewing machine shit. Yeah, it was in a, <laughs> it was like in a wooden box. Yeah, like a big wooden box. Yeah, like a big and, wooden and, box when they did that joint. And you wind that mother. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, man, you've come a long that's, way. That's a long motherfucking way, bro. So just long think wax to eight tracks, and then they shrunk it down to cassette. Cassette? That's right. Yeah. After after eight tracks, it was the cassette. You know what I mean? No, I mean, you eight tracks, my bad Lincoln Continental. Yeah, I bet you did. We all did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But that, uh, that cassette had that long-ass insert in it, though. I missed that. The credits. Oh, yeah, Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they give you lyrics to the song. Some people just give you lyrics to the song when he's tracking. That's how I learned a lot of Michael, or either reading the album covers. That's how I learned a lot of uh, Michael Jackson lyrics is being able to, you know, sometimes you'd be like, okay, what did he say right there? Boy, you just go to the album and be like, oh, okay, and sing it right along with him. Listen. That makes you even more of a fan. Let me tell you something. (laughs) I don't think Dave Chappelle know how much he got them looked out for me when he put that um, Good Times song. Cause nobody know what the hell that lady was saying. Hey, good neighbor Chola. <laughs> <laughs> yo, I say yo, if we can sit down and write down all the lyrics people wrote for that part, right? That was wrong. You know that's what I'm saying? Wrong. Yeah, that's, that's wrong. wrong. It's shit. Nobody knew who was saying hanging hey, in the child line, man. Hey, man, it seemed like Dave Chappelle was in everybody's brain when he came up with that because <laughs> when he did, I was like, damn, bro, I was wondering that shit back in the day too. Oh, like- but I feel like, like I don't know, but yeah, I guess it don't really mean that much. But yeah, he touched down on it, bro. Yeah, that's crazy, man. It's a whole bunch of records that we, we wish we knew the, yeah, you know, so, in the actual lyric. Yeah, man. So I can I can say, man, my parents play a part too, just in, on even playing music in the house while I was growing up. You know what I mean? Like on a Sunday while the house being cleaned, certain albums being played. You know, that that played a part of me even falling in love with the whole thing itself. You know. That's your first playlist. That's what you think playlist. about it. The parents, yeah. You know what I mean? Your parents, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Some of that you Tower know, Power, pops, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. Right. You know? My pops are the Crusaders, Temptations. Crusaders, there you go. Temptations o- for OJ's. sure. OJs. OJs for sure. He was a super o- OJs. Uh, Commodores. Commodores You know what I mean? Sure. Like, you know what? Oh, I just Commodores remember. was my first, was the first band that I l- fell in love with. And then I started getting familiar, familiar with everybody else. Man, I used to, I used to read the Commodores album. I'm like Walter Orange and Lionel Richie. I knew all the, I knew all the band members and everything, man. Cause I used to just look at all the names and everything on the album cover. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the album hey, covers was in, in the fifth grade. I would have been able to call each one of them out by their name. They would be like, "Who the hell is he?" <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact because that was McClary. <laughs> most kids weren't that intuitive about, you know what I mean, about detail like that. You know what I mean? Right. But I was the same way. You know what yeah, I mean? Man. But the artwork, they put more thought into the artwork back then. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? Like they really put some real thought into what this album cover is gonna look like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And see, like, man, that's the beauty too, man. Just think, man. And when I see stuff, I'm like, yo, man, we come from the era to where, just like with Shadi, right? When when he did his album, he could have easily just been like, all right, a picture of me. He was like, no, nah, but I'm gonna put the crew in here. I want y'all to get some juice. Right. You, know, you see me and my boy Mike Fresh, and on the, another album cover, you see our whole little Decatur crew on there. Because, you know, putting your boys on, putting your boys in the videos, you know? He had a, he had a Adidas suit on himself, though, right? Yep. I yep. remember that shit, bro. But yeah, see now, first of all, first of all, like right now, we, 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 we speeding because people don't understand your affiliation with Shadi. They don't, they don't even understand that's how you, that's how you came in, for real. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I came. I started in the game with Raheem the Dream, but I got in the actual game for real, and really, people started really noticing what the hell was going on. Is with Shadi. What song was that Raheem the Dream had that time? It was the first one that was uh, the title song called Raheem the Dream. That was in like 85, 86. And then we had another one called Eliminator. But you may know Raheem for later on in his career with this song called The Most Beautiful Girl, where he used that prince, the most beautiful girl in yeah. the world. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, that video played kind of like on some nationwide shit. Y'all ain't, y'all ain't clear that shit. Huh? Y'all ain't clear that shit. Y'all put that shit out, I already know. 
I think you clear. You know what? And that's crazy. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> fan too. Cause even on our first single, we used the beginning of Prince. And I don't think. Uh, I think we cleared it. I'm not sure, but nobody got sued though. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I don't think yeah, Prince man. was too much of a, a, a sample clear type of a guy. Oh boy, Prince didn't play, bro. He gave us a hard time, man. But yeah, with Shad D, um, yeah, man, the first guy to get me on an airplane. <laughs> um, you know, my family, I have beautiful family, you know what I mean? But we don't, we didn't never travel. My dad might have got on a plane when he was in the military and that was it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But my mom, she didn't never, she didn't want no parts of it. But yeah, man, I didn't really get to see the world. If it wasn't for the music business, there ain't no telling when I would have had a chance to really see the world for real, you know? Yeah, me, you and me either, bro, to be honest with you. Yeah. You and me yeah, this game, it took, took us places, man, to where, Shit, I never really had a would have had a reason to go to California unless I was on some corporate shit and they moved me out of there. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was just telling one of my folks too, man. You ever wonder sometimes, man, what would have happened if uh, how you uh, how you would have grown up if your parents decided by the time you were twelve to move to another city? If you would, you know, like what you would have done, like where the fuck would you be? It's deep, right? I'm gonna tell you my best failure in my life. Hmm. My best failure in my best life. Best failure. Wow, interesting. I took the ASVAB test for the army Ooh. and failed that motherfucker. The best failure in my life. I tried to fail it myself. Listen. I didn't try. I tried to pass that bitch. Oh, you did? <laughs> oh, yeah, you're right. Well, see, you're from VA. That's a military city. I can see you trying to pass it. Well, listen. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, yo, Desert Storm was just kicking off. Whew. Everybody that passed that test had to go to Desert Storm. Boot. They was in boot camp for two weeks, nigga. They was shipping these niggas up out of here. Like, I'm talking about Godspeed. Wow. Yes. Oh, like, you, you passed your test that weekend, you were taking your physical. Wow. And they were shipping your ass to get out there in Saudi Arabia. Like, I'm talking about Man. Godspeed. Yes. Woo. I'm going to tell Best you, man, in my, life. my senior year, after I had uh, won this DJ battle, and it was like Luke and the two live crew that was there, and when I found out that uh, Shadi wanted me to be his DJ, and I really locked in on that I wanted to be a producer, man, I didn't even take the SAT, bro. And I was doing good at school. SAT, what's that? <laughs> SAT, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, man, I, I didn't even go. Everybody was like, man, you going to go? I'm like, man, I, I already know. I said, I'm going to ride through the AU Center. You're going to see me down at Spelman, you know, getting them bras and whatnot. But I'm not going to be attending nobody college. <laughs> my dad told me, he said, boy, you going to college. I said, Pops, <laughs> you can choose to waste your money on a lot of shit. I don't think this be one of them. Don't like, do that. I ain't yeah. going to let you do that. This yeah. ain't, that's not my calling. I ain't want to go to high school, nigga. He tried to see me. He said, I didn't even want to go to high school. <laughs> like, <Woo -hoo -hoo! laughs> like, really? Like, nah, we, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to figure this shit out, but I'm not going there. Wow. So I never, yeah, people was, I saw a lot of people preparing for the SAT, like doing all these exercises with the SAT. Right. I never, I, I, I never, you know what I'm saying? That, that's that's what had me tripping, because, you know, like you said, I already had to make my mind up. I'm like, man, I'm going to get in this music shit and, and, and make something happen. But when I was seeing everybody getting prepped for it, and I'm kind of looking at them like, you know, you look at folks like who going too far because they say a storm coming? Yeah. <laughs> who just go too far? That's how yeah. I was looking at people preparing for the SAT, straight up. I ain't trying to be a fun of But I was like, I had no, no interest. Zero. I had zero yeah. interest. <laughs> and taking anything, a SAT, or it was another test they were taking too. Like I ain't take none of that. I was like, bro, I'm not, I'm not going to win that college. I already know that. Yeah. And see, I'm gonna tell you, the ASVAB, it was a mi military guy. They had us in the auditorium. This military dude walking around. Man, I'm just bubbling this shit, looking at him, smiling like, and I'm missing some of them. I'm like, man, I do not really want to be in here, man. But they made everybody take it. Well, I tried my best. Yeah, I. I ooh. <laughs> I didn't care, man, because, you know, I was anti-military, too. My dad, you know, he went to the Army, but I wasn't with that shit, man, that military shit. Mm -mm. So you went from, you ain't just go from Shadi to T.I. What was in the gap with Shadi and T.I.? 
Oh wow. What well, with, with Shadi and then um with Poison Clan. Wow. Yeah, you pull up that dance all night video. I was the uh the fourth member in the Poison Clan. I was in the Poison Clan. We toured the band in the USA tour, the Luke and the New tour. We had all kinds of tours, man. We was all over the place. And so after Poison Clan, um I ended up DJing for JT Money. That's me had who that. I spent for oh, wow. him, me, me and uh, my man DJ Kurt. You know when cats wanted to have two DJs, you know? <laughs> Both sides. Yeah. Both sides. And then um I started DJing for the Goody Mob. You know what I oh, mean? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I was DJing for Goody Mob for a good little while. Yeah, we toured with the Roots and the Fujis. Yeah, that's that was a little tour, man. Uh, yeah, man. Um, yeah, we, we had a cool little, nice little tour, man. Nice bus and everything, bro. That's some of that little so thing. So that's what introduced that's what introduced you to the Atlanta life. What's that? Fuck with the goody mob. To the Atlanta life? Yeah. Well, being born and raised here, really, I created the Atlanta life. <laughs> right, 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 right. I'm just trying to figure out how did so what what how did the whole Miami thing? Okay, well see with Miami, because Shy D had signed to Luke. Because you know, Atlanta. We had uh, a record label here called Ichiban Records. They was a distributor and a label. Uh, right. They had uh, 69 Boys. They had um, Jermaine Dupree and his group. This girl, girl's called Silk Time Leather. And he had this guy named Javier uh, Ichiban. Man, I can't think of the guy's name who had it, but um, it was him and his wife. And so, but Ichiban was cool, but Luke, Luke Skywalker records end up being the biggest label in the South as far as really just covering the whole country for real. And Shadi was signed to Luke, which was down in Miami. Cause so Shadi is from Atlanta too. Huh? So Shadi from Atlanta too. Shadi is originally from the Bronx. And he moved oh, wow. to Atlanta, I think when he was like 16. Yep. He's Bambada, him and, him and, him and Africa Bambada are uh, cousins. So he moved from the Bronx to Atlanta and he was breaking and everything when he came down here. He was he was like DJing and breaking. Then he started rapping later on. Yeah, I so played, that breaking. gotta be that gotta be tough. So who did the scratch? Don't gotta be tough. Gotta be tough. Oh, uh, that was DJ Man from Decatur. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, DJ Man. See, okay. I got with Shadi in '88. That was after I graduated. Uh, I graduated '87, but late '80, late '87 when I started touring with him. But then when it was time for a new album. That's when we had, we was down in Miami, you know, went down there for the first time. And um, yeah, man, we stayed down there for like, almost like three months straight until we finished the album. You know what I mean? And that just right. that was a, <clears throat> open uh, on just on another side of life, you know, seeing some real true dope boys with big damn Cuban links on back. We talking about 87 now, when these, the Cuban links that everybody bringing their net to get now, man, yeah. taking them big time boys down there, been rocking those, man. Absolutely. Getting it. And, you know, so I saw that, you know, the whole movement, um, being on South Beach, seeing these Ferraris and all these crazy cars. I mean, we had them here, but down there, man, it was just like crazy. Yeah, you know, South, whole, South Beach is a different kind of money. And it still felt like Miami Vice back then, too. You know what I mean? It's a different kind of, listen, it's a different kind of money in Miami, bro. Yeah, like, you be at the club in Miami, you, a Ferrari ain't shit. Nothing. It's a, it's a drop in that, you know what I mean? You may see five of them, different colors. GT down there. It's kind of like being in LA, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, you know, I, I started DJing too. But once you start sizing up that, produ that production side of things, what was the first piece of gear you was like, you know what? I got to get that shit so I can get my, first start doing my music. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna tell you the first one that I put my hands on was um, the little dramatics by Roland and um, and Boss. You remember the company Boss that made the headphones? Boss, no, Boss had a, they had a drum machine too, though. Yeah, Boss and Roland had combined. Yeah, they got together with a little drum, dramatics, is what they call it. And, oh wow! Uh, but that was just uh, you could really still couldn't just program. You had to just push the buttons. But the minute that I saw a SP12. Not 1200, but the 12. And when I saw that, well, you know what? No, a DMX was the first drum machine that I played with. That's when I did Writing the Dream. That was on a DMX and an MU Drumulator. 
But, right. the, but the drum machine that really made me say, oh, I got to get one of those, yeah, with the um, MUSP-12. And, but then the 1200 came about, you know, because the SP-12 only had five seconds of sampling time. But then when they came with the 1200s, it was 10 seconds. <laughs> Ooh, that's a lot of sampling time, man. <laughs> that's what you thought. That's what you thought. But that's why niggas were sampling on 45. Speeding it up. But see, and yeah, yeah, you, you try to squeeze about another 20 seconds out of it. <laughs> right. it, was kept dirty. It, right. Yeah, it was dirty. It was dirty. Gritty. Yeah, gritty. All that little Super 12. Gritty. That little ring, that little 12 big ring. Yeah. Well, it's crazy that now that's actually a plug in. And we, it was by default when we was getting that sound. Now you could get like a, a thing called a decimator that gives you that dirty. Yeah, I saw that. Green, yeah. you know what I mean? Decimal, that decimal, grit. decimator, yeah. That grit. That grit. That's wild because that's something that we was hating, but I'm gonna tell you, I don't know what Akai did when they came with that MPC 60. It didn't give you none of that grit, bro. When you sampled your drums and nothing, you like, it, it. And that's the second one that made me say I got to get one of those because see the SP-1200 is just a drum machine. The MPC was a sequencer drum machine. That part. See, I didn't understand sequencer until later on. And then when I started understanding, I was like, oh, you mean you can control keyboards with this? And MIDI notes? Like, bro, I wish somebody would have showed me that at the beginning of my career. Ain't no telling where I would have been, boy. Well, well, you know, down in Virginia, man, we all, we all started with the ASR-10. Mm. All of us. I'm talking about everybody. That's crazy. You know, Knots, Chad, Pharrell, Timberland, everybody. So that means the oldest one out of the crew had an uh, e EPS 16 plus. Who was that? Oh, I had a. Uh, I had you a, know, that, that was right before the ASR, the EPS 16 plus. First it was right, the EPS, that, then the EPS 16, then the ASR 10. Yeah, none of us had one. Oh, okay. But I, I knew somebody that had one. I started messing around with that first before I got the ASR to. Right. You know what I'm saying? But um, everybody's like, well, what it was when you went to the, when it was called AL&M, it was a record store, it was a music store right down here. Okay. Audio Light. So we went there. It was like, if you get a drum machine, and I still ain't got to play keyboards with. Mm -hmm. But if I get the ASR 10, I could do the drums and play the keyboard. Yes. So yes. it's like two on one. Type yeah. of thing, so you know, we was like, we're we gonna get this thing, yeah. It's all, yeah. You know what I mean, so that 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 right there was my first piece of gear. Wow, that see, I'm gonna tell you with the 10, um, I had an experience with the uh, Akai S950 when it came to a uh, sampler that can hold a lot of sampling time, right? The MIDI, the SP1200. And I had the Roland S950. That's why when I see um, Easy Mo B's set up, that's the same shit I had. SP1200, S950. And they fit right up. Right. It's almost like they made them for each other. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? I mean, because Primo was the same way. Primo had that 950 too. Yeah, that 950, man. And that was the first true, true sampler. You know, not, not, not having to squeeze sampling time out. That was the first right. real sample I dealt with. And um, but as far as a sampling keyboard, yeah, I almost bought a 16 plus, and this guy named Alan Floyd, he's like the music director for Beyonce. And he was like, hey, you know, he used to work at a spot, uh, Atlanta Discount Music. And he was like, hey man, you know, I see you about to purchase that 16 plus, that's nice. But he said, man, if you can wait two more months, boy, they got this new one called the ASR 10. He showed me the video. Right. He's like, I'm gonna let you get this just to go home and have a good time, but you can bring this back. And bro, I couldn't wait. Why? It wasn't even a month later. It was like two weeks later. He was like, hey man, it's here. Bro, I had a field day. That ASR <laughs> changed my life. Mm -hmm. The whole life. I started putting vocals in there, started doing hooks on it and everything. Everything. That bitch was that bitch was clean. You remember in them nineties when everybody wanted to fly their background vocals in? You can have a you you can have a piece of my love. <laughs> <laughs> everybody wanted well, to <laughs> well, see, what people don't what people don't understand is, with well, the young guys, the way you flew hooks were was to record the hook one time, yes. right? Get the mix like you want it. Mm -hmm. Once you got the mix like you want it, 
everything was in the right level, then you sample it. Sample it. <laughs> and then you put that shit in by hand in every spot. And boy, and it, and it flies right every time. It's all it, feel, bro. You can use it on a bridge, you know what I mean? And yeah. yeah man. Actually, I wonder um, how a, a nice R&B song will come together, put together like that nowadays. It might give it something else, huh? I mean, it's going to sound like the authentic shit we learned from. Yeah. Because people really you know what I'm saying? reach back and get what we come from, you know what I mean? Hey, man. Like I said, bro, you know, Hardware will always be what it is. Yeah, you can you can, you can come up with all these plugins you want to. Today. It's not the same. You know what I'm saying? It's, yes, it's not the same. Like you know, when you used to break inside those machines back in the day, they had light bulbs on bitches. You know what I'm saying? Tubes, like, when you, tubes. Tubes. You know what I'm saying? Like when you see that, it's like okay, you you did it with some real analog right now. Boy, and it's real. So, yeah, so you can't you can't replace that sound. One of those uh vintage rolling keyboards, I think. Uh, it's a rolling synthesizer. I think it's worth, it came out in the 80s, but I think it's worth like $7,000. And as they say, the way that that works, it's a certain tape inside. Mm -hmm. so it runs off a certain little tape that's inside of the actual synthesizer. Right. That's interesting. That lets you know that's a fucking analog, bro. That's why them bitches used to be so heavy. The keyboards used to, the keyboards were heavy as hell back in the day, Heavy. <laughs> Listen, you Super know, I told, you, I told you I traded my ASR for a Kurzweil K2700. Right. But now the dude who I traded with, he has the rack mount version of the 2700. Bro, don't you know I, I call him like once a month checking his pulse? Like, man, when are you ready to let that thing go? Because you're talking about no. Kurzweil 2700, right? If you midi that with whatever DAW that you're in love with. We won't have to pull up no plugins when it comes to orchestra. Cause that shit sounds so big and amazing, man. They say people still score movies with the K27 to this day, the Kurzweil. I gotta get that I rack. I gotta get I that. I had a Kurzweil. I had a Kurzweil I traded for a V-Drum. For who? V-Drum. Ooh. Ooh. You regret that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I do, but I didn't miss it because I had so much other gear. Like I bought all the emu shit. Yeah, oh, I had a rack. I had a whole had a, full of emu. Yeah, the Planet Fat Proteus two thousand. Planet Earth, the Extreme League, like you name it. I had all them shit. You know what I'm saying? All the colors. Hey man, I'm gonna tell you though. I don't care how much Proteus came with, bro. They were nowhere near rolling, boy. Nowhere near. It's like light years apart. Just think, people don't even want to touch. I know people right now with at least eight, eight modules of Proteus. Yeah, a rack of, with eight Proteus modules in it. But it's just collecting dust. But a rolling Phantom? Of course. Any no. Before the Phantom, there was the 1080. Yeah, the 1080. Yes, sir. Then the 20, then the 30, and the well, 50. Well, the 1080, I had the, uh, the 880, which was the slimmer one. Yeah. You see, you see that drum right here still. Look. Oh yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the fifty eighty right there. Boy, hey, that's the blueprint, ain't it? Yeah, hold on. Then that right next, right underneath that, you see what's underneath that, right? Oh, the S eight boy. Woo. The, the SC one. The C one, yeah. Then at the bottom, the Novation. Ooh, you would never sell that, huh? What, a Novation? Yeah. No, nah, I ain't saw none of that shit. Yeah, I hold on to it too, man. I'm telling you, I got, rid of, I got rid of my 1080. Since I had the Phantom, I got rid of my uh, my 5080. Yeah? Yeah, it was cool, but uh, cause I got like three cards in my rolling Phantom. So, it's like. I got about six, I got about six in there. Ooh, yeah, I wouldn't sell it either. See, I didn't have no cards yeah. in, my, uh, twin, in my 5080. Yeah, it's the orchestral card, the effects card. The uh, bass card, the 60s and 70s card, with oh, all the rows. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm like, no, I ain't. Because you can go to like 40. anywhere on this earth, bro. And it's a, boy, you, it's a slim chance of finding those anywhere. You hear me? Like a Brian Michael Cox or somebody get their hands on one of those and have a, have a seizure with that bitch. Yeah, man. Go straight crazy. Like, for real. Yeah. That's what, uh, what, uh, 
What was the process of you and you and Ti linking up though? Like, what was that about? How that how that even come about? Man, well, you know, um, me and his cousin, man, we used to we, we grew up together. We used to hustle together in the neighborhood, and um, he used to always, you know, tell me hey, I got a little cousin that rap, and um, you know, everybody tell you that. But then, yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> and when I finally gave him a listen, man, it was on a cassette. I was playing it in my little Nissan 280ZX, right? Bruh, he was jamming, bruh. Like, rapping, rapping. And, you know, and at that time, I definitely knew what a great rapper was because I was rapping myself a little bit. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. And, um, man, I, it just really um, it turned to a situation where once we linked up, we noticed it was a real chemistry there, bro, because he started picking out beats that I didn't think nobody was really ready for. You know, around that time, we talking about 1997. So it was certain beats that, that I was making that kind of remind you of some of that tribe backpack era, but then some of that Atlanta, you know, kind of Southern stuff still. Why would you call it Southern? I had some up-tempo stuff, but then I was kind of playing around with a few samples and I noticed those the ones he was leaning to that kind of all was almost East Coast or whatnot. And then I start hearing this flow. I'm like, okay, you know what? This dude here is a little different. He don't want the regular little Miami-based stuff I've been doing. Like he's really right. a little bit more advanced. But then come to find out, you know, he grew up half New York, half Georgia, cause his old man was in New York. So he'd kick it with, up there for the whole summer and just whatever break, spring break. So he, right. he saw an interview, he's talking about, you know, a lot of his New York friends who he still stay in touch with since he was a kid, you know what I mean? Right. So that, that played a part in him having such an incredible flow, the way he could just jump rope in between them beats, not just the regular cadence, but still had this southern ass draw with it. You feel me? Right. And that's what made it like, that's what made me fall in love with him. I started running around just bragging about him. You know how like you might back in the days, nigga might have a strongest dope. He go thumping his sack. <laughs> yeah. I was thumping my sack. I, you know, he was like 19. I bring him in the club with me. I'd be like, bro, it's the new guy, man. You know, yeah, what you working on too? Him. This dude right here. It's Tip. Right. That's KP, boom. That's whoever. Introduce him to everybody. You know what I mean? And um, people start catching on, bro. We start. Throwing, putting little demos together, you know? And that's when I recruited uh, Jason Jeter on the team because I knew we needed management. I, I wasn't really built for management. But, but yeah, man, we just realized we had a real chemistry and just hung in there, bro, and phew, started taking off. Yeah? Yeah, started taking off. And, and like I say, it took a while, bro, to run across anybody else in Atlanta who was really rapping for real. I don't know, and the guys who did show up, I'm wondering, did he even make, raise the bar to make people want to rap for real? Or had these guys always been pro focusing on their raps, you know? That's Cause it seemed right. like after he came out, of course, you know, you had Outkast, but they were so, it kind of still had the eclectic style. But Tip right. brought that real country boy, East Coast flow to the game to make niggas really want to step their pen up more. And then, you know, like I say, more people start rapping, but, but he started calling himself King of South because straight up, man, he felt it wasn't really niggas busting the way he was. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Well, run with it. You know, I'm like, bro, I didn't put my work in to where I can vouch for you. Who gonna doubt me? You know, some may will, but shit, I done put my work in to where I can, I can brag, nigga. That's right. <laughs> I'm OG, nigga. <laughs> <Run> <laughs> <with> <laughs> That part. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I felt mm -hmm. good about it. I knew I had something though, Bink. I really did. I know. I knew I had something. One thing about it, man, you don't you ain't gotta get beat across the head with something that you know. Yeah. You know how it makes you feel. You know, it makes you feel a certain kind of way. And yeah. all music on doesn't do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So when you hear an artist for the first time, I don't care where you at, how bad the sound system, you already know, like, okay, right. This here is something different. This right. This ain't normal right here. Yeah. And see, my boy, too, yeah. who I used to hustle with, he he was the one who got me in, uh, paying attention with, uh, to Jay-Z. Because, see, I used to be talking to him about all that different materialistic shit. He was like, man, you don't be listening to Jay-Z? I was like, nah, I ain't really. He like, man, let me put you on this reasonable doubt. But when he played Imaginary uh, Player, yeah, I became a Jay-Z fan. 
when he started talking about the you know the, the Range Rover and stuff like that, I was like, yeah. oh, okay. But come to find out, Tip been up on Jay Z. He was up on Jay Z before me. Nigga, we was listening to Jay Z when Breezy Without had uh, uh, what was it called? Uh, Freeze Records. It was it was distributed by Freeze Records at the time. Oh, it was a whole another label, huh? Oh, it was a, some small label he was fucking with. You know right. what I'm saying? Wow. And then they went to Def Jam. I think I played it with a priority, then Def Jam. Uh. But it was where Freeze Records was the first cassette that ever came out when we was out. That's the one we had. That's hard, bro. Yeah, but yeah, that's so we was talking on. about that 4.6 and the platinum up under that shit. You know me, I'm running around with all the dope boys and trying to, you know, save my money and get my jury game up. When I heard him talking that, I was like, okay, but then I'm gonna tell you, then when I first heard Tip's music, when he would let me hear his demo, because he had did the beats on his own. But when he started rapping about some of that dope and some of that material shit, I was like, oh yeah. Yeah, you 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 my you 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 that guy. You know what I mean? He did it. He get it and he knew what he was talking about. We come to find out, you know, he grew up under his uncles, because they were some big time guys, you know what I mean? Right. He definitely had been around and, and saw a lot to be such a youngster, you feel me? You can hear that shit in his music. And that's what I'm telling you, it's a few things that really just made me really hone into him and just put that energy into him because it made sense, bro. Because I was on a mission for artists around that time, too. That was everything, to be honest with you. <laughs> but my, my, I had a cousin from Brooklyn that would come spend summers in Virginia mm -hmm. every every summer. And he would bring the uh, chill, <clears throat> chill out tapes. Chill, chill out tapes from New York and red alert tapes from New York. Right. That's what saved me. Okay, nice. Being able to listen, yeah, being able to listen to that, and being exposed to those those mixtapes. Well, okay. it was, they were straight off the radio. They weren't even mixtapes. No, nah, see, straight. see the same thing with you on that. In nineteen eighty three, eighty four, I was listening to these guys. Used to be on ninety eight point seven Kiss, and they called the Latin Rascals, and right. they. There were some DJs who knew how to edit. And I'm talking about these guys actually chopped tape. Yeah, I remember that. Before the digital editing screen, you know, the black screen with the green words. It was way before yeah. that. These guys used to have these. Matter of fact, you can still pull their mega mixes up on YouTube. Just pull up Latin Rascals 98.7 Kiss Master Mix. Bruh, these dudes had some mixes out of this world. That's the reason why I started using the pause button. Because I used to make... I used pause tapes. Make, I, I get an old, cause you know the old, older pause button when you let the pause off is, is on point. But then later yeah. on it came with a soft touch to where it's a, like a slight delay. Yeah, exactly. I'm so good at keeping count on pausing where people thought I knew how to edit, man. And I didn't. You know, <laughs> I didn't know how to splice no tape, but the way, but when you hit my mixed tape, you would have thought I did. But that was my first thing as far as getting some New York tapes is the Latin Rascals. Mm -hmm. Having that influence was everything, man. Just being able yeah. to be exposed to that culture. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so man. was it ever was it ever any type of animosity uh, with you working with Jeezy and T.I. at the same time? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, man. man. A few inside sources was used to um, come to me, especially guys from Hawkinsville and Macon. Yeah. We were like, man, we got a boy from my town, boy. He coming at your boy, man. He coming at your boy. And at the beginning, they say, yeah, uh, uh, Jeezy was definitely trying to uh, make way up here because, you know, he was actually, you know, putting in work, you know, at a, at a young age. And when he heard that it was somebody else in Atlanta rapping about, you know, some trapping and getting it, yeah, Jeezy was trying to make his way up through here. And they, they say it was a little bit of... Um, I, I think on one of his um, albums, they say it was a little slick shit said the way he was just basically trying to get his position. But they ended up being cool. But at the beginning, yeah, Jesus was trying to knock Tip off the throne, boy. Yes, he was. <laughs> Won't go happen. And that's a conversation I ain't never heard them have either. Jesus should, should let that be known because it's definitely, I heard it from some of his closest people at the early stage, dude, before he even did the deal, before we even any trap or die. This was when he had the uh, Hard and Soft album. Right, the Hard and Soft. Yeah, Come Shop With Me. Yeah, yeah. It was, well, this album was Come Shop With Me. It was a hard and a soft. Yeah, just like dope. Only real niggas bought soft anyway. 
And it was put out on CTE. It was his label back then, too. He had put it out independent. Yeah, that boy. Yeah, yeah he had put it out. I'll tell you, he, the boy was getting money at an early stage now. That's, that, those are facts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jesus was getting some money now. Little young country boy getting it. Yeah, he was getting it. Had his own label back then. So that, um, but it was I've never, heard, um, but during the time, well, well, I started working with both of them. It was, it was cool. It was never no, nothing in the air. But, um, I know the first time Tip heard, uh, I love it. He hit me like, Hey man, that's a dope ass record, man. I ain't even know you'll do nothing like that. And I was like, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because the tempo and, uh, you know, the, just the groove. I really, you know, it's just a, it's something totally different. <clears throat> and, and what's crazy, I love it was one of them records to where you would have it in your playlist, but you wouldn't just play it. It's one of the ones you will pass over to where somebody would be like, hold on, go back to that one. I call, I call those type of records uh, Stand in the Couch records. Stand in the Couch. Oh yeah! Oh, I love it. At the club, you know, yeah. when them bitches get to stand and they stand in the couch, you got one. And <laughs> hey, you know what? I'll be telling cats too, man. You know, Meech started that shit, man. What? Back in the days, you would get kicked out of a club standing on the couch because that was real. God damn right you would. God damn right, nigga. They come to change for that. Get down, boy. Do, do you do that at home? <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it here, nigga. <laughs> They go, they gonna send the they gonna send the biggest bouncers to come get your ass. Nick, wide as him. Yeah. <laughs> hey bro, step down from there. Step from there, man. Don't, don't stand on the couch, bro. Hey, now somebody hey, hey, and you know what? And Alex and them, Alex get one. You know, the owners of compound and all the clubs here. Uh-huh. Oh, these new clubs, boy. Them couches made like out of like gel rubber, like gel rubber couches now. Listen, if you can see how these couches with the lights on, you wouldn't sit on. Yeah, exactly. Real shit. So them them club lights, them club lights had a lot of shit. Yeah, yeah. So them couches now are made for hookah burns, weed blunt burns, <laughs> uh, red bottom <laughs> heels. <laughs> Marks, all type of shit. Yeah, they say that boy. They say I love it. Stand on the couch song. Okay, I can see that. Yeah, stand on the couch song. I mean, what you know about that was too. Yeah, man. Those are uh, yeah. And see, and it's crazy you mentioned those two together because that's when I was in my real progressing, putting, you know, real progressions in the music around that time. Yeah. I heard the sample. I heard the sample where that came from. Which one? Uh, what you know? Which, yeah, what you know. It was a couple of different versions of that song, though. And so I remember... I thought it was Hey Joe at first. It was a, it was a, it was definitely a, 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 a white rock record. And uh, I was I was in the car and listening to one of those progressive stations and shit. Yeah. And it's, and I heard that because you can't you can't deny that chord progression. Right. So when that shit came on, I was like, Oh, that's what they got this shit from? I'm like, oh, I see why he snatched that. <laughs> it just started. It just started jam. Like it was a whole other part of the record. It just started jamming. Hey, that section came on. It was like a whole other record. Like wow. <clears throat> I got a story for you, man. Whenever records start beating through the charts, uh, I got a call from uh, L.A. Reed. And I was in my studio in the West End. It was about two in the morning. About one or two. Phone wrong. I'm like, man, who is this? I'm like, what's up? Hey, what's up, man? Boy, congrats, man, on the new record, bro. That's a fucking beast, man. I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you. Who is this? Man, it's L.A. I'm like, this ain't no L.A. Reed. What's up? <laughs> What's up? You know, I say anyway, man. So I hung up. I say I say thank you, man. But I say this ain't no LA Reed. And I hung up. Right. Shakir Stewart called. Rest in peace, my brother. Shakir hit me. Tune, what you doing, man? I say nothing. He said, man, Tony say he just called you, man. You hung up on him. I was like, get <laughs> <me out of> here. <laughs> and boy, he had a game. He hit me back, and I was like, man, I apologize, dog. He said, he said, man, that is beautiful. He said, man, yo, I, I, I heard the original, and I was like, yo, this guy's a genius. And boy, I would say about a month later, I had a song deal at Def Jam, bro. Half a meal. That part. 
And they gave me 250 up front, bro, with no problem. <laughs> That and, was I got the, the, and I got the back end so fast because Def Jam had so many artists. So I was serving everybody. That's why I got on the Brian Carey, the Jeezy, the Rick Ross, and, uh, you know. Shit, I'm in the once system. you found the right, once you got you in pocket with everybody else that knew how to write to that shit, the, the rest was history. Yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah, but I, one thing I definitely, um, <clears throat> excuse me. That Mariah was a good record, but I definitely still with I still want to get a big, big R and B record, man. You know what I mean? One of the big ones. to this day. It don't even have to have no. It don't even have to be a sample or a hip hop beat. It could be listen. It could be a sample, but I want it to be a real R and B record. I want one of those, and that's something. See, that's like, what you got. See, you, like, you, like, what? What you talking about? You could you could claim a dope a, a big R&B record and a big rap record. You know what I mean? To where it, Cam, Cam, you know, when I mentioned the Mariah Carey record, I had to say, you know, love you a long time. Oh, okay, I remember that. But you, she. <laughs> that that motherfucking and shout out to Bunny the Barge because she the one who wrote that record. Yeah, a dream. Yeah, she. They they were different. Like it took me a long time to, to realize that Switch was Bobby. Yeah, Bobby DeBarge. Yep. Bobby DeBarge. I I you know what I'm saying. Yeah. But I I, I hear the similarities. Yeah, yeah. You when know, you go back and listen to Switch albums, yeah, you'll catch it. Yeah. Fucking right. It's like the core <laughs> progressions. Yeah. Their core progressions, man. People <laughs> don't think like the DeBarges. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's why I try to get people to understand, like, man. Chords are like numbers. You know what I'm saying? They can be arranged in all different kinds of ways. Yeah. You know uh, what I'm saying? All types of different sequences. to me all the time. But you, you got to hear that shit. Huh? You get, but you got to hear it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like when you hear, it's like it's certain chords, like only one note is changing in the chord. And right. it makes all the fucking difference. Difference, <laughs> yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's it's like just I tell people all the time like you gotta understand, bro. That's why Curtis Mayfield was, was was why he was who he was because he tuned his guitar to the black keys. Mm. Ooh, that's hard. Never knew that. Right. So that's why his chord progressions were like they were. He tuned his guitar to the black keys. Yeah, the black keys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's nuts. So it, it, it's like, like I say, you can identify with a Stevie Wonder progression. Nobody yeah. thinks like Stevie. Easy, yeah. Excuse me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's why I keep trying to tell people, like, yo, every song, every sound of every genre, of, of, of every era of music, derives from somebody. Yes. Let me tell you something. I was just listening to. Uh, what's my man? When you love someone, you can't treat them like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Da, uh, Don, uh, Donald, uh, yeah, Donald Jones, yeah. That's, it, boy. That's Stevie all day, boy. All day. He did a great job at it. A, beautiful a great job. job. That's still one of my favorite songs to this day. Yeah. Oh. But that, that's, the, that's the energy that he was channeling that day. You know what I'm saying? He was. He said an Indian style on Sandy Grass. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Maybe all the whole town energy. Yeah. Yeah. Me. Like, yeah. Let, let me get all that Stevie, bro. <laughs> like I say, Curtis, Stevie, Prince. Right. Mike, even the way Michael Jackson wrote his chords to his background. Right. Right. Like, all that shit is signature. Yeah. Pharrell, Pharrell took to a lot of that Michael Jackson shit. Definitely. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? With it. Yeah, him and Chad, like, it's crazy. Super heavy with the Michael Jackson type oh. quotes. You know what I'm saying? You ever pulled up some of Prince uh, old live performances on YouTube? Nah. Man, them shit's jamming, bro. You'll feel like you was in the audience, bro. On your free time, just pull up some live Prince performances. That nigga was I actually, I actually got a shitload of Prince rehearsals. Rehearsals? How you get that? It ain't my business. It ain't our business. Yeah, you got I it. I get it to you. I get it to you, though. I love that. Yeah. Him, you know, all the sound checks. 
You know what I'm saying? She's doing all, all different sound checks. She, crazy. Mm-hmm. Something to get from that, I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, hit enter. You know what I mean? Please run that one through the Gmail, youngin. <laughs> so who who you are, who on your bucket list that you haven't worked with that you, you want to work with? She feel like if y'all two get together, is it press a problem? I think uh, me and Future get together to be a problem. I think I can give Future another 10 years, man. I can bring, I can, I think I can really bring something to him that'll bring a whole nother side of him out. Right. Uh, Future is one of them. Uh, definitely Drake. Um, and what's crazy, man, there's so many songs in my playlist. I'm talking about in different categories to where I could be like, that's Drake, that's Drake, and that's Drake. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Uh-huh. Like, you know, an artist, like, he can just flip styles and, you know, he crooned. And um, let me see, who else? Um, who, on the bucket list, on the bucket list, wow. I would still love to do something with Ice Cube. <laughs> I'd love to see what I could bring you know, out of Cube, man. You know what? And, and- I always felt like that too, and I finally got a chance to do so. You know, I did I did the theme music for the big three. Oh, okay. And Q was rapping on that. So that that was everything to me too. That was definitely about I can strike take them off the list. Okay. Yeah, man. I'm gonna tell you when I um you know, when I heard Cube on the America Most Wanted and stuff like that, that was cool. That was great. I love that. But when I heard how he switched his style when he got with uh, QD3, yeah. that's when I was like, oh, I would love to get in the studio with that nigga there. You know what I mean? I'm like, I see that Q could really, how he could switch his style up. You know what I mean? And um, honestly, man, just all, uh, ain't too many of my old school guys, I, was still, I still think I could pull out a dope LL record. Get, right. The right R&B, get the right R&B guy on the hook. And, and if I could give, I think I can make a nice chart topping LL record that's be that'd be nice for the ladies all over again. Like he never done it before. Ladies love Cool J. Ladies love Cool J, man. I'm talking about a nice right in the middle. It won't even be too adult. It'll be right in the middle to where the young bros will like it too. Everybody will love it. But like you say, with that right guy on the hook, yeah, man. I could I love to get in with LL. So let me ask you that. Since we're talking about great MCs, how's that you can't tell me nothing come about? Can't tell me nothing. Woo. That, well, that started from um, a Jeezy record that I produced called uh, I Got Money. Right. And um, another, some of them progressions with the horns and the live, you know, I had, um, had the lead guitars. And my boy, I think Craig Love came and put the leads actually played on top of that too, to give it a little bit mm-hmm. more dynamic. And um, so that song had originally featured, uh, was Jeezy featuring Tip. And then um, Kanye fell in love with that. That was one of his favorite Jeezy records, right? So Ye, you know, he used to listen to it. He said he used to just keep listening to it. He's like, man, this is one of the ones I play out this whole album. It's just something about this record. So when Ye fell in love with it, he, t- he hit Jeezy up and said, hey, man, let's do a remix and let me get on it. So he asked Jeezy for the drum track. And he was like, man, by the way, who did these drums? He was like, yeah, Toop. He was like, oh shit, I met Toop. You know, we did trap music. Okay, I remember Toop. Hell yeah. And really, Jeezy is the one who really, first one who really linked me and Kanye up. You know what I mean? And so yeah. when um that was my first time emailing, because I was me and Kanye was communicating, and he was like, hey man, so I want to do this. And then he said he say, want to get on the rap. And uh he put the girl on it. There. Oh, and so I started right. sending some other little stuff at the beat, this enhancement bass line to go along with it. So when he sent me something, I put something on the track and sent it back to him. So we was just going back and forth. Of course, I didn't know how to do that shit. My engineer, I had an engineer who basically <laughs> I was to. Of course, you know, I do that shit very well right now, but I didn't understand right. transferring no file to my computer to no Gmail and then sending it nobody. I didn't know that shit. And um, after a while, then he was like, hey man, I'm finna come to Atlanta and work, you know what I mean? And um, I want to finish that record. 
And when he got here, man, we just really put the finishing touches to it, bro. And psh, wait till I get my money right. What else I did while he was there? Any more records? We actually worked on the, um, and later on, that's when we started working on the graduation album. Because once he got down here, he just started really wanting to kick it down here more. So we just basically, uh, Def, Def Jam might have blocked out about what? About two months at Doppler. And that's when we started working on the, um, on the graduation album. And so, you know, on that album too, we, let me see. Um, I had Can't Tell Me Nothing. We did Good Life. And I did Big Brother. And there was another song that was supposed to have been on that album called I Done Did It All with him and coming. That shit was so hard. It reminds you of like a Jeezy track with these big ass horns in it. I but, done did it all. I, I, I done did it all. And it was him and coming. Never came out. Never came out. I wonder who got that shit. And they hard drive right now. And uh, yeah, man, I ain't gonna lie. It was real chemistry, man, when Kanye was down here working, dog. We went, we went in on that graduation album. Like I was there from beginning to end. From we started here and finished in New York at on uh, Chung King. Chung King. Yeah, they flew me up there. Barrick, Barrick Street. <laughs> yeah. They flew me up there, um, you know, basically just to kick it, man. You know, finish the album. And uh, what's crazy, though, with Big Brother, I originally had replayed Prince's song called uh, It's Gonna Be Lonely. Right. The bridge part that I used to fall in love with when I was a young and dropping the needles, you know, just listening to it like, ah, oh, I love this part of the song. And that melody just been in my head. I'm talking about every instrument. So I didn't even have to go listen to the record to replay it. I just right. played what was locked in my brain and got like very close to it, dog. Very close, you know? And so at first on the clearance situation, um, Prince was like, hey man, you know, I want um, 50%. First he said no. And then he said, hit, hit them back and said, I want 50%. And so all this was going on while we mixing now. We almost done with the album. Next. Right. And so um, then finally, Ye walk in and say, hey, man, Prince say, man, he want 100% of it, man. Let's just finish the record, man. And he, and he get that 100%. And I'm like, no, no, Ye, uh-uh, 100? I said, man, that's really just like him saying no. Man, but what's crazy, I did it, I had two different Macs I was working off of. The Mac that on Re, cause it was Reason 4, if I ain't mistaken. That Mac that had Big Brother in it was in Atlanta. So Def Jam had to fly me back down here. And the limo sat outside and I had to go upstairs and make a new version of Big Brother, man. It took me like, like eight minutes just to come up with a whole melody. I just let the beat play and just walking around. I had all the lights out up there in the old studio in the West End. Yeah, I kept on trying to come with some progressions that still gonna match with his vocals. Man, I'm looking at the camera, limo driver still out there. Like, dude, I'm talking about fresh from the airport to the studio. And I finally came with another melody, same instruments and everything, but just made a new melody. And it took about, about 45 minutes to, before I felt good about it. Man, I closed that computer up. And they had my flight booked. They were like, man, it shouldn't take you no more than two hours. Man, I got back in the limo from the West End, back to the airport, took that computer. And, um, and we basically, like, that was the last song on the album. So it was during the day when I got back up there. And Kanye um, was like, man, I hope this new one sound good. I said, hey, man, this shit jamming, y'all. You know, him, a few of the a rs were there. They were like, please let it be as good as the first one. I was like, I promise y'all this shit is hot. And uh, I told the engineer, I said, man, don't even let them hear it. I said, make sure you sync all everything up. I said, bring this mix up the same way it was with the original. I said, everything's the same place. All I did was move notes. So pull the same mix up. So I said, I don't even want you to press play. Don't let nobody in this room hear this until it's mixed like the original one. And once right. he right. Bro, when he pressed play, he just saw this coming up, just tapping me on the shoulder like, hey, man, you're bad, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt great. That I, I, right. I felt so good, man, from what I got from everybody. It was like, bro, that you went home and created a whole new melody to that shit. That was clutch. That was clutch, bro. 
And they flew my ass down there like in just a few hours. And say you took more than two hours, your flight, you know, you gotta be back on the plane. Now, now you know, the day I went in sound on sound to mix the rulers back for mm -hmm. blueprint, hip hop came over to the studio to chill with me the whole night. Nice. And uh, I loaded up the, the disc and the MP. And that shit said data corrupted. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 yeah. and let's be clear. Let's be clear. Shout out to Insonic. That's coming in the ASR. No, no. This is on the MP. No, I say that's coming in the ASR, but oh, very, yeah, absolutely. That's not the usual. Very rare. MP, bro. Yeah, very rare on that motherfucking MP. Very rare on the MP. Bro, that bitch shit. That 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 what you think you sat on that motherfucker or something? Man, I don't know what I did. All I know well, is one slight being to fuck it up. <laughs> all I know is I did it with Puff Records. So it wasn't even my record. You feel me? Wow. So I couldn't just go home and get the record. But you know, sound on sound and daddy's house is basically back to back. Right. Sound on sound on 45th, daddy's house on 44th. Oh wow. And my pop just so happened was in town. And uh, I said, Pops, we got to, you know, I'm playing it off with hip hop. And they're like, yeah, man, you know, y'all just go make y'all rounds, man. You know what I'm saying? We just want to be here working on this shit for a while, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but that was, you know what I'm saying? They were like, yo, I'm saying, you know, we're going to chill. And that's all good, man. I'm just, you know. So when I finally got them out the door, I said, oh, shit. I got I to gotta go over here to Daddy's house and first find the record. Right. Pop had a shitload of records at Daddy's house. Okay. Shit low. And my dad was in town, just so happy. So we walked over there, and bro, I was like in a sea of, I had records all around me. I'm in a sea of records. Probably about two hours. Damn near three hours. I found that motherfucker. I held that shit outside the pack, and I said, I found this bitch. <laughs> Ran back over the sound on sound, resampled it, reprogrammed it, Added other shit to it and mix it the same day. And there we go. Hey man, I was not taking that L. Listen, man, and that's that's when you can really look at yourself in the mirror after taking a good piss while washing your hands and say, "Man, well, I'm a bad motherfucker." <laughs> you know what I'm saying, man? Okay. Another thing just what took it's, the L. It's, it's one of the moments. It, it, it ain't even a, a a a vain thing. You know that you really pulled yourself out the mud, bro. Cause it could have been that 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 big brother couldn't have could have easily just said, "Hey man, no, nah, it didn't make the album." What? Cause you know if I would have had four records, if I would have had one more record on that Kanye album, I could have been like, I could have asked for like at least co-executive producer on that joint. Whew, that would. That would look great, huh? Let me tell you some shit, though. Let me tell you a funny story. Speaking of uh, sampling and using, going through somebody else's record collection, Dr. Yeah. Andre, Andre Young flew me out to LA, man, for about a week to work. We was at our record one, the same room with them big ass speakers. I think Michael yeah. Jackson designed that room. Yeah, Teddy like did. Huh? Teddy designed that, that studio for, for okay, Mike. He was working with Mike. Yeah. Okay, there you go. I knew it was some kind of connection. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think uh, Dr. Dre had this assistant named Brandon. Right. Like light skin dude. Look, look, little Mexican dude, right? Mexican dude, I think he's Mexican, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Brandon, I, I, so I'm walking through record one and I'm like, damn, boy, it's a whole room full of records back here. Whew. I say, hey man, I can go back here and go through these racks? And he's like, yeah, it's cool. So, I see him on the shelves and I see a few crates. So of course, I'm gonna go to the ones that's at reach, right? Man, I'm flipping through. I'm just looking at the album covers. I'm like, oof, get that one. I might have walked out there with a stack about this thick, ready to right. sell, you know. Boy, I got in there, man, and I might have made about six tracks. I might have sampled about six, made six different records out of samples in maybe three hours. Right. Hope ass ideas. That nigga Dre came back in that motherfucker, you know, fresh out the gym, because he had his own gym back then. He might still have it. Yeah. Him and uh, what was the other guy named? I think the dude named Dip. Who? 
Not, not DLC. No, I was an older guy who he was hanging out with. Like he worked out too. I don't think his name was Lonzo. It might have been Lonzo, but not from the Wrecking Crew. It was another Lonzo. Right. Was so when Drake came in, he was like, boy, what y'all got? So I'm in that motherfucker. He was like, that shit right there. He said, it sounds familiar. I'm like, oh, OK. And he bobbing his head. Then I'm like, yeah, here go another one. Then he was like, whoo. Then he, he like, where Brandon at? I ain't know where we're going. <laughs> And then, and then he, he whispered to Brandon something, boom, boom, boom. And then he, and then Dre walked out, right? Brandon said, hey, man, don't go back in that record room, man. <laughs> yes, man. That's right. That nigga Dre. That's right. That shit jam away. Is it? And Brandon's like, yeah. He said, no, nah, man. He said, it's hidden though, I love it. But man, I'm the, he, he, he said, if I, I chose like three records that Dre already had picked. That lets you know where our ears are, man, as producers. Yeah. And I'm talking about out of all the records I, I dropped the needles on, I sampled the, the, at least three of them out of those ones. Was Dre were like, damn, that shit sound familiar. Woo. But he done made so many beats, or made heard so many and just don't know. Like, hey, yeah, I've been digging in your motherfucking bag, boy. <laughs> you get that look up my, who the hell I let this nigga my cookie jar? Hey man, he was like, he said, "Where's Brandon?" I didn't know where it was going. That when Brandon was like, hey, man, <laughs> "Can't go back in the record room no more, man." Boy, I said, "Boy, y'all niggas something else, man." Set your ass up. Woo. Well, yeah, Dre was good people, man. Yeah, he flew me out there. He had to fuck with him. It was cool. Who was you programming on out there? Well, Logic or who was you? Using? I was Reasons. on uh, Reason, it's still on the MP, MP and Reason, and the ASR. Yep. MP, Reasons, and ASR. Yeah. What was, uh, what, what you did on uh, the Kanye shit on, the same shit? I can say, and I had a Phantom there too. I didn't have, it was the X, it was the Phantom S, not the X6. But with Kanye, that was, um, yeah, Akai MPC 60, um, Rolling Phantom, and the ASR. But I time stretched uh, Michael Jackson on Good Life. I time stretched that with the Rolling Phantom. Cause at first when Kanye had it, it was like I wanted. I was telling him for it to have that same energy. It need to be back at the same pitch as the original. But with just right. you know, same. Yeah, but you know, if it was dark, it would have ended up being a dark beat. And so that's when uh, my man, um, I started playing with the synths. Then my man Craig King was on deck. So he came and blessed us with his fingers. And, then, and he, we, we took it down, man. But now nah, that was, um, yeah, that, that MP, I mean, the, um, that Rolling Phantom played his part. Motherfucker played a major part. Yeah, it's, it's stacking them, them, them synths. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's what that, yeah, for sure. Yep. Phantom was great for, you know, for, for pads and synths and shit. It was great for that. That's all I love it was, straight Phantom. Phantom and the MPC, nothing else. I don't even think the rolling, okay, the ASR played its part on I Love It on the, on the low end with the AO8, but everything else was Phantom and MP. That's why I tell you all the time, man, when you're trying to find a new keyboard, take a keyboard player with you. Yeah. Don't go in there by yourself. Nah, you go, I learned, you I learned go my lesson with that. Yeah, you be like, bam, 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 no, it's whack. And there's so many parts that, that they're going to fill in that we're not, you know, that we just going to leave open as programmers. Yeah, the polyphony of it all isn't yeah. there when it's just us. That's why I say, when you get somebody coming there playing some goddamn eight finger chords on your ass. Right. Or, or you know what I'm saying, some five finger chords. Right. It's a whole nother whole nother sound, like, wow, yeah. this just sounds great. You know what I'm saying, like. And you want, want me to tell you what's, what, 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 what used to be kind of embarrassing? Sometimes when I used to bring a keyboard player in is while I was building was the track. And it was a few times I tried to have them to play while I'm sequencing and realized that the MPC didn't have but so much note polyphony. Boy. So we just used to have to just record the track and I let them play over it. I'd be like, hey man, let's keep this rhythm right. And since you're a professional player, 
we ain't gonna sequence you. We just gonna let you play over the Pro Tools. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's the best way to do it, man. Not the best way. Not the best way to do it. I could take I could take four years of piano lessons tomorrow. You know, start from that four years from now, and still want somebody to just come bless it for real. Like, yeah. Yeah, man, that's what take it there, though, man. But like I say, Bing, you know, this shit's still fun, man. What the industry is now, man, it's, it's, it's like, first of all, ain't really nobody coming out with albums. And to me, it feel like the record labels are still, like, in COVID type shit. To where now, when I approach my, um, my setup, it's, it feel like a hobby again. Right. More than trying to get on somebody's album or get a placement, you know what I mean? It just feel like, hey man, you got melodies in your head, whatever you run across, just, if you love it, save it. If you don't, erase it and go to the next. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the, the thing is, is, when you allow yourself to be free mm -hmm. while you're creating, it, it stays fun. But yeah. when you come in there, when you come in there chasing something, yes, it ain't free, no, it ain't fun no more. It ain't. You know what I'm saying? Because you're trying to mimic something else yeah. that's, that's not in you, rather than just... That's why old groups used to put albums out like every three months. Right. And one album may be kind of gloomy. That's how the fuck they felt that three months. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. <laughs> the next album, Up Tempo, they, they, they jamming. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, that's just how they felt. So it's like, yeah, that's how they felt. People, people, yeah, so people be having like writer's blocks. Yeah, because you're trying to write a happy song while you say it. Yeah. And um, that's what that was uh, with CeeLo. Remember, we had the song Crazy? Yeah. <clears throat> he was just going through a divorce. So that's the energy that he felt when he wrote that. That song was about what he was going through. And when the label was trying to squeeze another big record out of him like that, he was like, hey, man, y'all stop asking me for another crazy record. I'm going to give y'all a record, but stop, stop using that as a reference if y'all want a, a big record for me. Like, I was going through something. Like, I can't just do that again. You know what right, I mean? Right, on command. And, and that's, to me, ultimately, yeah. that's, what killed the game. that's what killed the industry. Oh, Having another, bucket list, another bucket list artist, Kendrick Lamar. Who's it? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Me too. I co-signed that one for myself too. Yes, Kendrick. Kind of like we did one with them that they, that they put out and never paid me, but it ain't never gone. You know what I'm saying? So, uh. one of those type of situations. But, wow. but, but corporate, the, the corporate part of the music, like they got these kids feeling like they could pull a hit out their ass on command. And it's, and it's, and it's nothing. And I'm like, bro, that was the case. Jay Z would have made two reasonable doubts. Right. Michael Jackson would have had two thrillers. Right. You know what I'm saying? You no, know, you can't. You can't just pull out greatness. No. As a as like a body of work on command. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's like you know that's you why know, I blame. You don't know it's great until it's done. Right. But that's why I blame corporate America and ours for making these kids regurgitate the same shit over and over because they keep asking for that crazy record again. Yeah, they keep asking out. for that big brother record again. And all this like, bro, that was what that was. Let that be what that was. Right. You just need to be asking for another great record. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Period. In the story. Yeah, whether it's, it's other tempo record, story, man, whatever the fuck it is. Don't, Just get another good record. Don't, don't align it to the last hit. You know what I mean? Let me ask you something too. <clears throat> I told my manager, I said, hey man, I think um, I said, I got a, I think I got a placement on the new Rick Ross album. He's like, okay, cool. I say, um, the first thing he say, is it a single? I'm like, man, I don't know. I say, man, I say it's a, I say, I don't know. I say, nowadays, bro. I don't even think artists even looking for a leading single no more. I think folks really just want to put their albums out, huh? Do people really sit around and decide on what the first single is nowadays still? Yeah, because, you know, you, you got to release one, one record first. You just don't release the album. It's always yeah. one song playing. But what I'm saying, but nowadays, you know, but, like, but, but from where we are now in music, 
for an artist who's a certain age in an age group and his style is a, a certain style, you almost got to ask yourself, who's really to judge what that man first single would be? Like as a young artist, you would say, okay, you compete with Roddy Rich and the rest of them. You know what I mean? And, and, and Lil Baby and them. But an artist who 40 plus, who, how would, and on what, 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 um, what bar would you set to say is the, just like we think about uh, Aston Martin music or what was the other one? Um, just like with Jeezy record, gotta me alone, you know, with Neo singing on it. It's kind of like right. at that time that was a cool single to have, but you know, kind of got to ask yourself, even if Jeezy was trying to pick a single, how would, what, what would he be judging and basing it off of? Of the airwaves of what's out there? Or would you just say, I'm gonna just be innovative and put this record out, say, fuck it. This, it I ain't trying to put out, a, I'm just putting out what I think is a good song off my album more than to blend in with the whole single playlist on what's out. It's weird right now to me. They, the innovators and leaders pick the best song on the album. People that are followers, they going to be chasing Sonics, is what I call it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What's the hottest thing out right now? Like, what's, what's the hottest thing out right now? Like, you know, who, what sounds people using right now? Like, you see for like two years straight now, all these flute samples. Right. You know what I mean? Everybody want a flute sample on the record. It's like, right. it's just, it's just retarded. You know what I'm saying? Like, nobody wants to do something different. Nobody wants to dare themselves to do something outside the box and, and make people start doing this. Right. Like, everybody just, they treat music like karate styles. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, if you are a innovative person, you won't allow yourself to mimic shit. Right. That's how I feel as a producer. You know what I'm saying? It's like you, you're not gonna allow yourself to mimic anything, but I, I'm you know, I, I get you you're a fan of certain shit, you like the way that shit sound, but I have a damn if I'm gonna change my whole shit up. Yeah. To be in a certain pocket that right. somebody else is in. I can't so, so what I'm saying is, yeah, so so what I'm saying is like even right now, right? The club scene still ain't really the club scene. You know how niggas say, hey boy, it's right here for the clubs. If it ain't really no goddamn clubs, what? It's almost like, like I say, what the hell is considered as a first single nowadays? Oh, what, yeah. what are the dynamics you will be looking for to, 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 to identify this record off of these 14 as the first single? The because, everybody, because everybody always invites certain people to the studio and play the album. And most of the time that same record people gravitate to. Okay. Like, yo, I fuck with that one. Like, that, that's my shit right there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, they start doing their little, you know, their, their tests with that. Bringing people in, they, they respect their ears. And then you gotta bring in your regular people like your kids. The kids will tell you. Like, you know, me and my kids, I don't never say, hey, what y'all think about this? I just play it. Mm -hmm. And if they start in their little box, you but got you gotta one. Get back to asking though, who you trying to cater to though? <clears throat> I'm just saying, kids just like good music. Yeah, they you know and how they can zoom in on certain things. But if your album don't consist of those elements that that catches a kid's ear, but it can still be a good album. I mean, Kelly, yeah, it could be. But like I say, they be known. Even the the record they don't have been listening to, they know. Okay. The groove, the groove is there. You know what I'm saying? Even yeah. if you don't listen to the little to what my daughter zoom in on, though. I feel you. Yeah. The, the beats, like, but if they come in the room while you playing the beat, Jamie, just walk in and say, Daddy, can you all give me $10? That ain't it. This ain't the one. They just come in here and just talk over top of the motherfucker, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Ask you for what they want. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't the one. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you might want to switch this one up because they ain't, they ain't really rocking. 
with this one right here. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, but you know, but other than that, shit, you got one coming out on Ross. Uh, uh, me and you only hooked up with Kanye one good time and never been back. And we got arguably some of the, you know, his most, you know, quoted records. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So I'm hoping mm-hmm. that... Uh, Have you talked to anybody over there in that camp? <clears throat> I mean, other than the mutual friend, me and you both got both. Right, 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 right. Okay. No, you know, I don't fuck with Mike Dean like that. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I won't be talking to that clown. <laughs> but but uh, other than that, no, nah, it's just, you know. Best shout out to Mike I'm Dean. Like, for, yeah, yeah. I love you. Shout out to love both of you guys. Anyway, <laughs> whatever. Anyway, I like I say, I know Kanye. I don't need to go through nobody else to talk to Kanye. Right, right, 100. That's how I feel. You know what I'm saying? We gonna a, talk to this rap. I haven't had a number on Kanye in a long time or email. Years. For yeah. years. I haven't even seen him in a, in a minute. Like, I see him on stage, you know, but I didn't, didn't get a chance to really holla holla. Um, we had a uh, we had an email relationship at one time. We had a pastel email. Yeah. You know me what I'm saying? Me, Back me, in the day. Me and Jay-Z were emailing for a minute. We, we yeah. Was, I think it was him, uh, but the way he was responding, it seemed like it was him. <laughs> hey man, never can tell these days. I hope they want playoffs <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? Now he flew me up to New York one time and kick it and hang out with him. Me, him, Beyonce, and some of our friends. We hit about four clubs in one night. You know, and to this like day, I still don't know what that meeting was about because we really didn't talk about nothing. I just kicked it up there with him for two days. It was after the um, American Gangster. I don't know, that's why I was wondering, like, I don't know if it was a test that I was supposed to pass or what. To this day, I still don't know. Did you do something on that album or no? Which one? On American Gangster. Yeah, say hello to the bad guy. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. That, that was real magic how that came together. Because, you know, he was supposed to. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, to this day, I, don't, I still don't know how they ain't called me for that. But You know cool. what? Well, I'm a, I'm a, I, I could tell you how it happened because that album really, they snuck it out. A lot of people didn't even know it was coming. But you got to think, he was really retiring. That's when he was at now it's just retirement, right? And so the nigga Big John hit me whispering. <laughs> My big brother, uh, shout out to Big John. He hit me, uh, he said, hey, Tom, what's up, man? What you working on, man? I was like, oh, you know, just out here doing it. He said, hey, man, Jay-Z's working on a new album, man. You know, uh, you know, the American Gangster movie's coming out. He's just going to title it American Gangster. Hey man, hey man, if you can, you know, don't call Def Jam. Don't call, ain't nobody paying for your flights or whatever. He said, man, you and Nudge, man, y'all got some money, man. Come on, man, fly up here, man. Get on this album. And immediately, I said, I said, man, do you want originals? He said, man, bring original, but bring some samples too. And that's when I got that, um, that, um, the love we share. I think that's by Tom Brock, if I'm mistaken. Mm-hmm. And, um, I just started chopping up samples. I went through a few samples, and that's why, um, and when I was working on that beat, that's why you can see on YouTube when they say DJ Toon, the making of American Gangster, say hello, say hello to the bad guy. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's footage that one of my homeboys was in the studio while I was working on that beat. But all the whole day, I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta take something to New York for Jay-Z. And out of all the beats I made, that was the one that's played in the longest. I went and ate lunch, came back. You know, you like to hear what it sound like when you leave the building and you leave it playing yeah. when you leave and walk back in. Yeah. I walked outside, upstairs, downstairs, and just, I, yeah, I put the bass line in. Then I just start adding all the elements, man. And everybody who came to the studio within that eight hour day stuck their head in the room like, bro, I think he gonna get that one. I said, yeah, I hope so, I hope so. And um, me and Nard, we went on and got our reservation together. I was staying in the, uh, the Hudson Hotel <laughs> with a little bit of energy. But I like the energy the though, I love the energy. The bed on the floor down there. Yeah, <laughs> it's small. <laughs> so um, I went in and when I got there, it was uh, him, Usher, No ID, Jermaine, and uh, um, Engineer, um, my guy, your guy, Guru. Guru. 
And so Jay was like, hey, man, um, ain't going to lie, man. I've been listening to beats all day, man. I'm going to give you, a, you know, I'm going to let you play a good three of them. I was like, for real? I'm like, damn, bro. I, want, I, I, I was hoping I could at least get about a good six. And so right. I put on my headphones. I narrowed it all the way down. I made sure. And, and Bernard, my manager, he was like, hey, man, make sure you play the one you was fucking with yesterday, man. And then you heard Jay like, yeah, man, make sure you play the one yesterday. Like, it must be <laughs> so, like your man saying it. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> sitting in here. You got a good sense of humor, too. So, um, and I played the first joint that was hard. You know, he was like looking, okay, looking, and I'm like, okay, okay. But boy, and no, I elbowed me like, man, get to the shit. Just going to get to it. Man, I threw that motherfucker on. Jay started rocking. Guru looking at me with a look. Yeah. And he saw that he's, he looked back and Jay started whispering, like moving a little bit. Like, well, that's a wrap. When he, when he get that, that's a wrap. And nigga Guru elbowed me, like, oh, yeah, you got him. You got him. And he, he, when he started whispering, rapping, this is his own. That's and a wrap. Then he stood up. And that when that nigga No ID took his headphones off, like, what the hell going on? Because JD was like, raised out his seat. And No, cause no ID was in there working on the beat. As a matter of fact, he was working on the one with them organs in it. I can't think of the name of the record. It has some real crazy organs in it. But he took his headphones and was like, damn. I'm like, yeah, boy, we on. And she, boy, that nigga Jay was in the booth about at least eight minutes later. He said, hey, man, hit the mic. That boy went in and killed that shit, man. And JD went and did the hook. Say hello. Say hello. That was JD on that part. <laughs> yeah, Magic, bro. Magic. If and when me and Jay, I'm glad, I, I, I'm glad I can even afford to fly to New York and just pay my way, you know, instead of waiting for. Right. I mean, you got you got listen. The one thing about it, you got to invest in yourself sometimes. Yes. You know what I'm saying? You can't yeah. be always expecting somebody to be like, "Oh, we'll fly you down, put you up." Like, no. Nah, if you feel like this is a a great enough placement or opportunity for yourself, yeah. Fuck it. Spend that two, three racks. Yeah, man, you, you know what I mean? Bad. Yeah. Go and put that yeah, little three, four thousand aside or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, going out there and lock that shit up. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've done that a few times. Like, you know what? I'm just go down here to LA and just go out here and shake some hand, kiss some baby. Let's see what's crazy. Oh boy, that little three thousand did his thing. You got paid for the track and they got you more work. You know what I mean? So got you more work, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And we going to the record store. And we going to the record store. Yeah, all that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't know if you've been to Amoeba yet. You been to Amoeba yet? To who? Amoeba, yeah. Amoeba. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Yeah, I, going yeah. There. Uh, I think Mr. Mix turned me on to Amoeba. Amoeba is incredible. Yeah, all my listeners. Do so they don't get a prop, boy. That boy, Mr. Mix, who did all that two live crew shit. That nigga, that oh, was he, with the SP 1200, bro. All that, all that shit was clean, clean, bro. He his samples. He never really got into. See, he was the first one who showed me how to um sync the F SP up with the um two inch reel. Right. Using right. Where he'll load one disc in with the first part of the beat because I noticed his was never speed sample. He always sampled at the at the regular 33. Now I'm like, right. oh, man, all your samples clean. Like we say, we was trying to squeeze time out of it. But he showed me as far as how you have two or three different discs. So you put a disc in and load it in to get one part of the beat. Then he ejected and put another floppy in. And yeah. Then Two inch gonna sink that part in, and everything came. It was magic. Oh, boy, I liked a lot being down around that boy, man. David Hobbs, oh, yeah. bad boy, man. Yeah, that was the name. David Hobbs, Mr. Mix. David, uh, shout out to David Hobbs. Yeah, man, he definitely was a bad dude. Yeah, he was in DJ battles back in the days too. A new music seminar. He battled uh, Cash Money, uh, Joe Cooley. And who else was in that battle? DJ Cheese. Rest in peace, DJ Cheese. DJ Cheese. From New York, yeah. Uh, you remember that song, King Cut? You know you want a slice? Yeah, DJ yeah, Cheese. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Get some <laughs> scratch up to be the go. That's that I'm <laughs> DJ Cheese, what? You can tell that, that old school vibe when you hear the, the flow. Two oh, yeah. players, the phone's a kind of king. Two players, the kind of king. Two players, it's a kind of king. Yeah. It's always up and down. It's 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 up and
I always wanted to put me a group together, and I was like the middle, you like the the, the the center of the group, the DJ, DJ Two featuring, you know what I mean? Right. That's uh, it ain't too late. It ain't too late. Weird, crazy. Yeah, I still got a crazy little DJ show, man. I'm working on this medley now where I can do a straight DJ show and play all my hits and shit. Take that shit on the road, you know? It looks like I said, it ain't never too late. Put that shit together. Still fast yeah. too, bro. Still in battle mode. I, I I never, like I said, I never could scratch like that. You know Ever. how to play huh? You say you I'm a mix. Zig, I'm, a, I'm a zigga zigga blend nigga. Right. <laughs> <laughs> good enough. That's good enough. I, good I rock enough. a party though. Yeah, That's for sure. Party rocking, for sure. Yeah, keep that party going, bro. Like yeah. I said, I ain't gonna keep you too long, man. You know what I mean? I know. I'm enjoying it though. Hell yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. But that um, uh, I'm trying to think uh that uh that Serato sample, man, is definitely a blessing. I don't know if you got into it yet or not. What is that? Serato sample. What? Listen, man. Them Chico. people really was thinking about us when they made that Serato sample, man. Thank you, yes. Serato, the creators of Thank you, Serato sample, yes. It's a DJ program. I'm loving that. But that Serato sample, you guys, matter of fact, I heard they got a whole DAW now. Is that true? Yeah. Yep. Play with it? Not yet. Me neither. Not I want yet. to see what it's doing, though. Just from what the Serato sample do, I want to see what it does. Thank you for um, what? How many more pads they put on it? What? I think got like, what, 16 slices now? I think it's 16. I thought it was more. I think it's 32 now. Might be 32. I may be bugging. A few of them. Like I got this template now to where you can um I got about four Serratos on there. If I ever want to use that many. Because right. you got you got to map the keys to where okay, after one and however 32, then you got to have it where it start. But now nah, you can have all of them lined up, man. It's crazy. And um Studio One, the only one I've seen so far that you can do that. Yeah, man. That now you live by that studio one. That's me, man. That's that's my that's my monster. Like I even you, I still use Reason. Um, and I even like using Reason and Studio One together. But now I don't learn how to mix better in Reason. Now we was just talking about you know how I need to really learn it. Now you talking about how Michael Keys gonna be banging it out. I told you, Battle Cat is the guru. He, the, uh, he of of Reason, huh? Battle he Cat. For my birthday too. What's up, Battle Cat? Yeah, man. Yeah, Battle Cat, big bro Battle Cat is the guru of making that reason smack like nobody's been there. Me and Mike Keys wow. talk about that shit all the time, bro. Like it's crazy. It's, Guess it's insane. And, Guess what me and Battle Cat met? What? Mobile, Alabama. Damn. Uh, we had like a little about four day tour with uh the record crew, that's when they had before you turn off the lights. Yeah. And uh Tony Tony Tone. They had Lil Walter out. And um with Shadi, I think we had Shake It. Shake It was still in rotation. And uh Battle Cat was DJing for the uh record crew. And uh he had a nice little yeah, DJ yeah. routine. And when he saw, yeah, when, when he saw, so we both was like peeping gang. Cause when he saw me on the table, he was like, damn man, where you from? I'm like Atlanta. I'm like, where you from? He's like, LA. I'm like, damn, boy, y'all LA niggas. And I was asking him about Bobcat and all the rest of them. He right. Like, yeah, my folks. Then I ran into him again at the uh, New Music Seminar in New York. And that's when DJ Scratch won up there in New York, New Music Seminar. Another, that's my other big bro. Shout out to Scratch. He made, oh, Scratch, he made, that, shit, he, he made that shit look so easy, man. That's oh, what yeah. makes me sick about him, yo. Get on oh, my yeah. nerves with that shit. <laughs> that nigga got the soft. Soft ass tech, like he barely touching his shit. Like he just what's, what's funny about Scratch though? Scratch will do a difficult trick, but it'll look hella easy. That's what I'm saying. Like he makes that shit look it, so it, effortless. It sounds faster than it looks. <laughs> he just he'd be like, okay, how you do that? You know that just tripled up, right? When you just did that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Like, right, like, he always doing, like, doing that, like, like, ain't nothing. But the way he look at the camera, he know he just fucked you up, though. Yeah. The way he do, the, the look he give you the camera, like, yeah, all right, like, go and study. Go study this. Go study this. <laughs> yeah, go study this. <laughs> Hell yeah, man. So what, what you, uh, what you, what, what you thinking about the MP? You still messing with the MP, the ex? Man, that bitch in the corner now like a broke submarine, man. I ain't talking to that bitch on the minute. It's been treating me probably got, pretty right, man. I ain't gonna lie. When I'm when I'm, I got, not, I'm not on Studio One, I'm on the MPCX, and it's. I gotta do an update. Okay, I gotta do a software. Yeah, I gotta do a software update. Yeah, matter of fact, shout out to KLC. He he hooked me up with the um, <clears throat> school, ran me through the whole update, he helped me get all my shit together. So now my. Well, see, I need to call his ass today then. Yeah, KLC will get you right, man. He, 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 I think, and he got this homeboy who can get on the phone, man, and guide you right through it, bro. Get you right. You ever, look, you, you ever seen his picture with all his drum machines in it? Yes, man. Respect, bro. Hey, hey man. I said that's that's like a drum machine porn. Yeah, you know it what is I mean? drum machine porn. <laughs> like, like for real. Yeah, he. Hey, man, it was crazy because I sold my SP twelve hundred in twenty eleven. Because, I mean, it was a good thing just to have laying around, but like, I bought it for like 500. I sold it for like $2,000. Man, do you know that drum machine is worth like 6,000? People selling it for 6,000 on eBay Which one? Right SP 1200. Oh, I bet. Cause I see, I had a few drum machines laying in the floor. I, it wasn't as good as, it was close to KLC's, but I had the 3,000, 2,500, the 60, the, um, the SP twelve hundred. Then I had a, I had two three, I had a four thousand. And what else? It was about See, everything. You, yeah, but everything you had was from the nineties and better. This nigga you know, shit went back to the eight hundred eight. Yeah. Yes. Lin Lin drum yeah. eight hundred eight, like all that. Like that's a problem. You got to be a yes, yes. Yeah, yeah he's a yes. beast. <laughs> he's a fucking animal to have all those joints too. True animal, and dog. And then and, and took time to sample all the drums from him. He did? Yeah. That's sick. Yeah. He hooked me up. He did all the 808s of the uh, 808 joint. I got him. Um, he said he gave it to me. Call, he called them serious lows. Wait a minute. He called them what now? Seri serious lows. Still white. Serious loans? No, lows, like low end lows. L O W. Oh, lows. Yeah, serious lows. That's what they call it. And that shit sound insane. Man. And it's funny, right? When I heard y'all on, um, and he was talking about some of the stuff he done, I was like, bro, we might have been doing I told, I called him. After I saw that interview, I said, bro, I believe we was doing that shit at the same time. Oh, that boy said he was dancing, pop locking, and doing graffiti. I said, bro, I was doing the same exact thing the same year that you say you were doing it. Spraying on the yeah. side of the grocery stores. I used to draw a dude on the turntable. I have DJ Toomp and this crazy little writing, only a graffiti dude would know it. And I used to put, it's in the mix. I have a DJ on there with the headphones. I put that on, like, on the side of like two or three different grocery stores. Yeah, that shit been going, right? Shaking cans like Raymo in them. Kick, 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 kick. Raymo! Krillon, yeah, go to Kmart, get a whole lot of paint. Yeah, I used to be getting down with that graffiti. Me and my homeboy DJ. I never did a graffiti. Showing up. Nah, yeah. I was just a uh, break. That's, that's hip hop that, enough, boy. I got my, my mom's, my pops hit me. I'll make sure everything all right. But, bro, come on, man. I, I, I appreciate you. Okay, I appreciate you. Man. For almost yeah. two hours. You know what I mean? Talk, talk and shop. I think we're going to put this out, Mariana. Hmm? Like ASAP. I think we're going to put this out, ASAP, like tomorrow. Okay, shit. Oh, yeah, man. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Happy, once again, happy belated. Thank birthday. you, brother. All right. Make 50, make 51 look good, my nigga. I hope I hope I can have all my teeth in my mouth and if I have shit that 51 like you, you know what I'm saying? That'd be a great thing. <laughs> now I got to get back to my 100 push-ups a day, man. I slacked off. I was doing good at the beginning of the COVID. 
Yeah. Start eating late, boy. My gut that got out, but boy, I had to get it back down. So now that I got the weight back down, I'm finna start back doing my hundred push-ups a day. Hopefully that'll be back back. I need to go. I need to go ahead and challenge you with that. I need, I need to get on that shit, my damn stuff. Yeah, man. Cause you know you do. You could do like you could do them in sets of twenties. You know what I mean? Yeah. And just keep count. And um, half of them in the beginning, and half before you go to bed or in the middle of the day. Long as it's a hundred within a, a twenty-four hour that day. day. Every day, I promise you'll see results in the first week. First seven yeah. days, you will see you'll be in the mirror like, oh shit. Oh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> that, that me. That me. That me. Hey, 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 hey baby, come here. Hey, baby, come here. <laughs> that's a crease. That's a crease right there. You see the crease. You see the crease. <laughs> <laughs> But shit, hey, love you, my nigga. I'm here to tell you, man. Okay, boy. Sign off, man. Peace. One. I do.